Hello and welcome to part three of our second week of Ethical Issues in Computing and Technology, Winter Semester 2024. In this video, we're going to talk about privacy. The reading that was assigned was in the Reynolds textbook, and that's chapter four, but I am going to mention a few topics from the chapter in the BAS about privacy. I'm actually going to start with the bath. You are not required to read it, but it can provide a little bit of extra context, especially if you decide to write about a particular topic for your essay. You can get some extra examples um, by looking at the other textbook. The reason I start with the bath here is she, I think her introduction is a little bit stronger. She says there are three key aspects of privacy, and this is on page 48 in the bath. She says there's freedom from intrusion or being left alone. Like I've mentioned, negative rights in the last video. Two, control of information about oneself. And three, freedom from surveillance. Why should we want privacy? We always hear the people saying, well, you must be doing something shady if you don't want people to know about it. But of course that's not true. Of course the desire for privacy doesn't necessarily mean, or at all, that we're doing something wrong. We want to keep our health data secret or private, our relationship information, our family issues. We might want to keep religious beliefs, she says, and political views private from some of the people we interact with. Privacy of some kinds of information, of course, are essential to our goals and our well-being, like our bank information. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, sort of the philosophical foundations of the concept of privacy in a bit, maybe sort of toward the end. That is also in the past. But before I move on to our reading, I'm going to say one more thing from the opening section of the BAS. On page 49, she tells us privacy threats come in several categories. And we're going to look at all of them when we look at the laws that are supposed to protect our privacy. Intentional institutional uses of personal information in the government sector, primarily for law enforcement and tax collection, and in the private sector, primarily for marketing and decision making. So we have personal information that is directly and intentionally used. So that's a threat to our privacy. Unauthorized use or release by insiders, the people who maintain the information. There's theft of the information. There's inadvertent leakage of the information through negligence or carelessness. And sometimes our own actions threaten our own privacy. Sometimes it's intentional when we do the trade-offs. And sometimes we are unaware of the risks. You might think of the video we watched last week, which when I first heard about it, blew me away. We are in, if you announce your sexual orientation on social media, this gives information about your social network to outsiders. Now, when we are interconnected so deeply online, when we reveal something about ourselves, there may be unintended consequences. Another phrase that we'll hear about quite a bit this semester, unintended consequences. Moving back to the actual reading for this week. This starts on page 133. That's where I'm starting anyway. There's a vignette right before that. And Reynolds tells us, as you read this chapter, consider the following questions. What is the right of privacy? And what is the basis for protecting personal privacy under the law? What are some of the laws that provide protection for the privacy of personal data? And what are some of the associated ethical issues? Uh, we also get questions about strategies for consumer profiling and its eth ethical issues. Um, employers monitoring their employees, and advanced surveillance capabilities. 
And we're told in both chapters, but we're sticking with the Reynolds at the moment, that the basis for privacy in the United States is the Fourth Amendment in the Bill of Rights. And it's so important that we're going to read it out in full. This is on page 134. Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, if you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, there's no privacy right. So if you're out in the middle of the town square, you cannot claim a privacy violation when someone sees your face or what you're wearing or what you say loudly to other people. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy there. You can see that this doesn't even specifically mention privacy. There's no such law in the Constitution, and privacy law has been a patchwork quilt built up over the centuries. As you can imagine, of course, the Founding Fathers writing in the 16, 1700s, um, 1700s, could not possibly have anticipated computing technology, and thus there is no one-to-one -one application of this amendment to the issues that we face right now. But the courts have consistently recognized that we need protection that evolves with the technology from the government abusing their powers and taking away our civil liberties. First we get, I'm just taking a look at what I want to talk about specifically, we get privacy laws, applications, and court rulings. Then we get a whole bunch of the legal things that have happened from generally the 60s up until this was published in 2014. And that's something I want to mention right at the outset. Sometimes looking for textbooks that are free to use does come with a trade-off in that they are often a bit older than the textbooks that I might require a student to purchase. And a lot can change in 10 years, and a lot has. I've updated a lot of it, and we can talk about that as we go through, but I haven't updated everything. So when you answer your homework questions and when you write your essays, be careful to use what's in the text, but also figure out if anything significant has changed from the publication date until now. So we say here, okay, we have financial data that means protecting what laws have been passed to do so. First, we get the Fair Credit Reporting Act in 1970, the Right to Financial Privacy in 1978, the Graham-Leach Bliley Act of 1999 and the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act of 2003. So our first area of concern with the law is financial information. And we get with the first one Fair Credit Reporting Act. I'm going to do all acronyms for this because it would take too long otherwise. In which the operations of credit reporting bureaus have to report how they store, collect, and use your information. We learn for the first time here 
that the FTC, or the Federal Trade Commission, is the default and de facto champion of citizen data in the United States. There's no official department for data protection as a blanket. So through the years and through legal precedence, the FTC has become the foremost government arm of data protection. The next one, the Right to Financial Privacy Act is also on page 136. Protects the records of financial institution customers from unauthorized scrutiny by the federal government. Before this was passed, you didn't get to know. The government could grab your personal records from your banking institution and you would never know. After this was passed in 1978, you need actual paperwork that tells you the government wants your records and you can say no unless there is a search warrant. Um, this is another time that will get a very important mention that it only concerns the federal government. It doesn't deal with state and local government or private businesses. So you have to be vigilant and careful and know the, the laws in your region as well as giving permission to businesses that have your data. What does this mean? Like when you go to a random shopping site and you put in your credit card information. Now they have your credit cards. Um, and we might be to the point at which it's unlikely for the business itself to perpetrate fraud, but you have no idea the security that they use or the methods that they use to protect your data and you have freely given it. The next one is the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. So I'll just put that as Graham-Leach-Bliley Act or what it's normally known as the Financial Services Modernization Act. Now in the early part of the 20th century, the 30s, when people were trying to recover from the Great Depression, there was a lot of anti-monopoly pressure where huge businesses were broken up because they were said to have monopolies over their industries, like the Bell Telephone Company. And in this, um, it prohibited any sort of financial institution uh, from offering investment, commercial banking, and insurance in any one company. It had to be three separate companies. And this was known as the Glass-Steagall uh, Act, and this repealed it. So now you can go to a place and you can get financial advice, you can invest, you can have your bank, you can get insurance, all from the same company. And a lot of people think that this deregulation contributed to the housing bubble collapsing and the economic depression of 2008. Um, sorry, I am looking for a bit of evidence that I wanted to share with you, but I apparently did not highlight it, so we're going to just move past that and go on to the very last piece of legislation that deals with financial information privacy, and this one is on page 137, the Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act. This was in 2003. And it is a, an amendment to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the first thing that we talked about, meaning that 
uh, you can request your data and fight it if it's wrong at any time. So you're, this is the law that said you ha you're allowed to get a free credit. No, you are not allowed. You are, uh, the credit companies are obligated to give you a free credit report once a year. And there are three major credit reporting agencies in the United States, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So you can and probably should request a copy of your credit report from them every year to check that everything is right. Because oftentimes it is not. Um, that actually happened to me a couple times. I had stuff on my credit report that was not mine. Now this chapter is quite a litany of federal law after federal law after federal law. And it is important to talk about the details, but I don't want you to get lost in the details. So say you were going to think about the ethics of financial information security. I would want you to think about things like how would you protect financial data online? What sorts of access should governments have to it? Should they have to inform you? What about businesses? Should there be rules about how often they have to purge or update their systems in order to protect your financial data? Why? Where is the burden? Is it on them? Is it on the consumer? Is it a mixture of both? Is, should we have more government regulation? These are the higher level questions that sometimes get a little bit lost when we're focusing on the patchwork legal system instead of the ethical value and moral system that we want to simultaneously sort of think about. The next set of data that we're going to talk about, which has had quite a bit of changes since computing and digital technology has become a large part of our lives, and that's health information. We get HIPAA, which most of us, I think, have heard of. This was passed in 1996. Um, this is on page 138. We might have heard of HIPAA, but we don't always know what it stands for. It stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And it is supposed to protect your data by providing standard codes and definitions for everything. So you can take your health insurance and port it from doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital, and your data is still protected. HIPAA violations are taken seriously, even though there are so many people and sometimes the enforcement can be logistically difficult. You can see why you might um, need this kind of protection from this little example. I don't necessarily like the examples in this book. I like the comprehensive descriptions of how the world actually works. Their examples are a little too vague, um, but we get an employee in Mission Hills, California, unaware of HIPAA privacy regulations, was at a hospital, posted a patient's medical record, including her full name, and made fun of her condition online. When it was presented to him that he was doing something illegal, illegal he said, man, it's a joke. Um, so you can see, because once something is out there, it's out there. You might be able to punish someone, but you want to protect the information in the first place, of course. Where are we here? 138, 39. Okay. Okay. Then we get the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act pay, uh, passed in 2009. Um, this is after the financial crisis of the housing bubble, 
And, but the one that matters to us for information privacy here is title XIII, that's 13, subtitle D, known as the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act or High Tech included strong privacy for provisions for electronic health re records, including banning, this is why it's important, banning the sale of health information. So we haven't heard of high tech, but it, it bundled in, even though it was talking about recovery and giving subsidies to companies, very big ones, no sale of health data. Then we get the next topic with information security and privacy, children's personal data. A very thorny issue in which oftentimes the measures that are proposed to protect the data of children end up censoring or taking away the freedoms and liberties of adults. Um, so some of them, well, these ones have generally been not repealed, but when we get to the next chapter, many of them have. Uh, so we get FERPA, and this is on page 139, and that stands for Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act passed in 1974, which you have the right to access your educational records that are maintained by a school, to demand that the educational records be disclosed only with student consent, to amend educational records, and the right to file complaints against a school um, for di disclosing your educational records without your permission. Okay, here's where I was getting a little ahead of myself. The COPPA Act or the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act passed in 1998, says that any website that caters to children have to offer a comprehensive privacy policy, notify parents or guardians about data collection practices, and receive parental consent before collecting any personal information from children under 13 years of age. We also get first, or now, excuse me, Another issue, electronic surveillance. Now this one's pretty long. I am not going to go into all of the minute details, not least of which because many of these laws that are discussed have been radically altered by subsequent legislation or even let lapse like the Patriot Act. Uh, the Patriot Act was a huge deal, hugely controversial, offered what some thought to be blanket and way too extensive rights to get wiretapped and surveilled by federal agencies. But as of 2020, it was left to expire. The one scary thing that I really do want to talk about in this section is the National Security Letter, or the NSL, and we get the definition of this on page 142. Um, under this act, which is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, a national security letter can be sent to an internet service provider to provide various data and records about a service subscriber. An NSL compels holders of your personal records to turn them over to the government. It's not submitted to judicial review or oversight. No subpoenas, no warrants. Um, they can do trap and trace, which means they figure out who's calling in from where or a pen register that actually can record the sounds that you're dialing to know which numbers that you're dialing as they listen. And the NSL is gonna come back to bite us later on because they can be used for secondary purposes. 
Instead, I'm going to jump over to, uh, finally, we're done with the long list of legislation and move on to fair information practices. Now, this is a codified system of ethics that is the ideal sort of version of how people should treat data. Let's see the definition that they say, page 146. A term for the set of guidelines that govern the collection and use of personal data. Right. And the ideals here we can find on page 147. Collection limitation, data quality, purpose specification, use limitation, security safeguards, openness principle, individual participation, and accountability. So they're only allowed to collect certain data. It has to be obtained lawfully and fairly. The data quality has to be accurate, complete, current, and relevant to the purpose that it's used. Purpose specification. You have to say why you're collecting the data and not use it for secondary purposes. So a lot of times you're collecting information on a social media, and that's going to be packaged with a whole bunch of other data and used to sell to advertisers. That is a secondary purpose. Security safeguards need to be protected. Data policies should exist and available to the people whose data is being collected. Individual participation. You should have the right to review your own data, challenge its correctness, and change it when it is incorrect. And there should be someone in the company who is collecting your data that is accountable for your data. Now, one thing that you could write about for your essay are the differences in the United States and the European Union, which is said to have maybe the world's most comprehensive and strong consumer protections for personal data. Under 1995 European Union Data Protection Directive, and in here it talks about the updates um, I forget what it's called, Protection, um, European Data Protection Regulation. So 1995 was the first one. The update was proposed in 2012. The book was published in 2014, and it did get passed and adopted, but not until 2018. So you could look into the European Data Protection Regulation to see something that is hailed as the standard, uh, at least the the furthest standard we have gotten today. Okay. So what are some of the problems with online personal data? There are probably ones that you're already familiar with, but we want to think about some of the nuances. Data breaches. Electronic discovery, consumer profiling, workplace monitoring, and advanced surveillance technology. Now, data breaches are pretty straightforward, uh, but the thing we might want to think about is just how common they are and how many people they affect. We get a list from, what does it start? 1984, 90 million records, Sears Roebuck. But then we get a big jump to computing technology for people whose records were stolen or breached and we get all of the cases at least up till 2012 of the millions and hundreds of millions of people's data breached and not kept private um it's 
says 46 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands have enacted legislation requiring organizations to disclose security breaches. This is on page 152. Now it's all 50. All 50 states in our territories say if a, there's a breach occurs, the business has to tell you because prior to the state law, that was not the case. One thing we might be a little bit less familiar with, electronic discovery. Discovery is the process of collecting, preparing, reviewing, and producing information for uh, criminal and civil actions and proceedings. Of course, in the digital age, a lot of this is electronic. And it, to use a term I've used a couple of other times, it's kind of a mess. You can think about if a giant corporation is involved in litigation, just the sheer volume of records that would have to be analyzed, stored, and put into e-discovery. Because the thing with discovery in a legal system is you can't keep secrets from one another. The plaintiff and the defendant have to share information. Um, one of the key ethical issues is how much responsibility businesses have to protect this data when they know that they are going to be involved with legislation. They ask a little bit of silly questions at the end of this section. Should an organization ever attempt to destroy or conceal incriminating evidence? Of course that's not ethical. Of course it happens, but it's not necessarily a real or the best ethical question to ask. Um, and I'm, I think there are a couple better ones in the question section. Consumer profiling. This is one where I might jump over to the other textbook for examples because they talk about the Target case, which crossed the line for many people, in which their data tracking consumer information systems noticed that if people were buying unscented lotion, women especially were buying unscented lotion and unscented laundry detergent, plus a variety of other things all together, they were likely pregnant and they sent them coupons for baby stuff. Now imagine how you would feel. You might not even necessarily know that you're pregnant yet. You just have a strong scent aversion all of a sudden and you get these coupons. That would be a little bit strange. Um, even more so, I think there was one instance when this happened where the coupons were sent to uh, a young woman who was underage, 16 or 17. Her father discovered it and was very angry at Target. Turned out that the young woman was pregnant and that's how the whole family started to figure it out. A lot of people think that that is an incredible violation of privacy and Data in aggregate should not be used to target individuals in this way. There's also a bias here that I've detected in this section, workplace monitoring, in which it says, plenty of data support the conclusion that many workers waste large portions of their work time doing non-work related activity. One recent study revealed that between 60 to 80 percent of workers, time online has nothing to do with work, and workers spend four to five hours per week on personal matters. And this, the book says, is a reason to implement workplace monitoring, not recognizing that we might not need 80 hour work weeks, we might need better pay, we might uh, have to study what so actually constitutes efficiency. So there have been studies that have been done that demonstrate that if you trust people like adults and you are straightforward and they have a fair wage and benefit and security systems in place, job security, then they will be more efficient. Um, then uh, there's an Australian businessman who went to a four day work week after doing extensive statistical analyses and recognizing that 
if he had his employees figure out how to be as efficient as possible, they could reclaim an entire day back to themselves. And it worked. Their profits actually even went up. So automatically assuming that you cannot trust your workforce and that there aren't underlying causes to some of these issues demonstrates a bias. Now you don't have to agree with me or and you don't have to agree with them. Uh, I just want to point out bias when we see it. And finally, maybe the scariest of them all, the recognition that with super high technology, there may not be privacy in the way we have thought of it in the past. Now, governments, or excuse me, law enforcement agencies can gather a ton of data without actually even entering our houses or talking to us. There are satellites and um, infrared cameras and scientific sniffers that can smell out the molecular composition of things that are inside of a room. They can use technology to scan what's underneath our clothes without ever telling us and tons of stuff that we probably don't even know about. Um, we get camera surveillance, vehicle event, data recorders. Those are the two main examples in our chapter, but I think the ones in the other chapter are a little bit better, the bass. We are going on a little far here. I was gonna talk about section 2.52 or the sort of philosophical foundations of the idea of privacy but given that we're already running a little bit long I'm going to just mention that it's a fascinating topic that starts on page 100 it talks about if there really is a right to privacy or if all claims of privacy actually boil down to property rights you have property over your own body over your own house. So if someone tries to spy on you in your own house, it's actually your property that they're violating, not privacy. Um, but I'll leave that up to you to think about. So this is part three. In part four, we're going to talk about chapter five. Then we'll talk about the essay assignment instructions and we'll be done for the first part of the week. See you in part four.